So in this lecture, we're going to look into a few more details about collisions. So the textbook reference for this lecture is the Halliday, Resnick and Walker textbook sections 9.6, 9.7, 9.8 and 9.9. First of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas we encountered last lecture. In the last lecture, we learned about linear momentum and saw that it's given by the equation P, which is our symbol for linear momentum, is equal to mv. And momentum is a vector in the same direction as the velocity vector. We saw that net force is related to the momentum by the net force is equal to ma, that's Newton's second law, which is equal to m dv dt, which is equal to dp dt. So the change in the momentum over time is equal to the net force. We saw that net momentum of a system of particles is given by just the sum of all the momentums of each individual particle, which we can write as the sum of mi vi. And so we saw that we could relate this to the velocity of the center of mass. So the net momentum was equal to the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass. We saw that impulse is useful and it's given the symbol J or sometimes I and it's equal to the integral of the force with respect to time. So the change in momentum is the impulse. So if we know how the force changes with time, we can work out how the momentum changes. And we saw that when no external forces act, the momentum is conserved. This must be so because this thing is then zero. So the impulse and the change in momentum are both zero. Okay, so we started this lecture with a fun demo where we asked what would happen to this cylinder and most people thought that the cylinder would roll down the slope, which is usually correct, but this was a, actually a special cylinder with an unbalanced mass. So when I let go of it, it actually rolled up the slope. So it actually had a higher mass up here, so the center of mass could move down, moving the cylinder itself up the slope. Okay, so we're looking at collisions, so different types of collisions. There's different ways that we can classify collisions. So in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. And then we've got inelastic collisions where some kinetic energy is lost. And there's something which is called a perfectly or completely inelastic collision in which the colliding particles stick together and so have the same final velocity. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll write down equations to describe a collision between two particles in one dimension for each of these different situations. And then in the lecture we had a look at some demonstrations. So this will be very useful for you for the laboratory exercise collisions and car crashing. But let's go write down these equations now. Okay, so in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. So we're going to write down the equations that describe the collision between two particles. So momentum is conserved. So we've got m1, u1, where u1 stands for the initial velocity of body 1, plus m2, u2 is equal to m1, v1, where v1 stands for the final velocity, and m2, v2. And we've also got the equation a half m1, u1 squared plus a half m2 u2 squared equals a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared. So we can cancel out the factors of a half in this case and end up with the equation m1 u1 squared plus m2 u2 squared equals m1 v1 squared plus m2 v2 squared. So for an elastic collision, both this first equation and this second equation must hold. Now in an inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. So in this case, we've got just equation A holds. This is A plus B. And in a perfectly or completely inelastic collision, then the particles stick together. So then we can write for our momentum conservation equation, m1 u1 plus m2 u2 is equal to, now because they're sticking together, they're moving off with the same speed. So we've got the same final speed for the two bodies. So we can write it this way. So this is the equation that describes what happens in a perfectly inelastic collision. B does not apply because the kinetic energy is lost. So in this problem, we've got a projectile proton here with a speed of 500 meters 
per second, which collides elastically with a target proton initially at rest. So let's color our target proton over here red and our projectile proton here has an initial speed of 500 meters per second. Then after they collide, the two protons then move along perpendicular paths with a projectile path at 60 degrees from the original direction. Okay, so after the collision, this one's going off at 60 degrees, that's this one here, and the target one is at right angles to it. So that means this angle in here is 30 degrees, and this is our target proton here. And we're asked after the collision, what are the speeds of the target proton? And we'll need to also find the projectile proton. Okay, so in this collision, it's elastic. So we've got momentum and kinetic energy conserved. So momentum is conserved. And since momentum is a vector, that means it's conserved in the x direction, which let's take this as the x direction, and it's also conserved in the y direction. So in x direction, we can write, well, initially, the target, the projectile proton is moving with a speed of 500 meters per second. So we can say mass of the proton times u. And then afterwards, both of these have some velocity in the x direction. So we can split their velocities into horizontal and vertical. So we can split their velocities into horizontal and vertical components. So let's label this one v1 and label this one v2. So horizontally we've got v1 cos 60. So this is mp times v1 cos 60 plus this one here is also a proton, so it's also got mass mp times v2 cos 30. And you can see that the mass of the protons are going to cancel out everywhere. So we can write this as v1 on 2 because cos 60 is a half plus v2 root 3 on 2. And now in y direction, Initially, there is no momentum, so we've got zero. And then afterwards, these two have opposite y components. So we have mp times v1 sine 60. We'll take up as positive minus mp v2 sine 30. So we can write this as v1 times sine 60, which is root 3 on 2 is equal to v2 times sine 30, which is on 2. So we have v2 is equal to v1 root 3. So let's look at, substitute this back into our x direction formula here. So rewriting this, we've got u is 500. So we've got 500 is equal to v1 on 2 plus v2 which is equal to v1 root 3 so v1 root 3 times root 3 on 2 so we can say well multiplying everything by 2 we've got 1000 is equal to v1 plus root 3 times root 3 that's 3 v1 so this is equal to 4 v1 so that tells us that v1 is equal to 1000 over 4 which is equal to 250 meters per second so that is actually the answer to B because that was the V1 was the speed of the projectile. So this is 250 meters per second. And then the target, that's V2. So we've got V2 is equal to root 3 V1. So that tells us that V2 is equal to root 3 times 250, which is equal to 433 meters per second. So this is 433 meters per second. Now, we should just check our answer because we didn't actually use when we were coming up with this that it was a completely elastic collision. So because it's a completely elastic collision, it tells us that kinetic energy should be conserved. So we should check K is conserved. So we've got initially, we've got a half mp times the initial velocity squared, which is 500 
squared and that's equal to the final velocities and we've calculated the final velocities here so that's a half mp times 433 squared plus a half mp times 250 squared we can cancel out the half mps and we've got 500 squared which is 250,000 which is equal to when I do it on my calculator, I get 249,989. So within our significant figures, this is absolutely right. So it does look like we have performed this calculation correctly. So we then looked at the ballistic pendulum. The ballistic pendulum is when we shoot a bullet into a block, which is free to swing up like a pendulum. So the question was, when the bullet collides with the block, is momentum conserved and is mechanical energy conserved? So when the bullet collides with the block, momentum is conserved because external forces are negligible. The forces come from the bullet on the block, so those are internal forces. Now, is mechanical energy conserved? Well, no, it's not. I mean, if you hear a bullet colliding with anything it tends to be quite loud so it's losing energy through sound energy um, there tends to be a lot of friction as well so energy is generally not conserved um, and then it says when the block and bullet rise is momentum conserved so then we had the bullet embedded in the block and then it started to rise and in that case momentum is not conserved because gravity is acting on it to slow it down and that's a significant external force and then is mechanical energy conserved? Well, it is in that case because gravity is acting, but it's not a non-conservative force. So in fact, non-conservative forces aren't significant as after the collision. They're only significant during the collision. So then we had a look at the ballistic pendulum, which we will do very shortly. But um, And we calculated the initial velocity of the bullet from how high the ballistic pendulum went. Now to practice this for Physics 1A, try questions 4 and 5 in set 3. And for higher Physics 1A, try questions 5 and 6 in set 3. So this demonstration is of a ballistic pendulum. So in this case, I've got a bullet which is loaded here. I've pulled this spring back. So at the moment, there's a lot of potential energy stored in that spring, which I'm going to release very soon. That's going to give the bullet some initial velocity. The bullet will then shoot into this block of paraffin here and hopefully become embedded in it. So during that collision, the momentum is conserved. The initial momentum of the bullet goes into the final momentum of the bullet plus the paraffin. At that point, the paraffin block with the bullet in it begins to move and it continues to move up until all its kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy. So we can use the height it moves to to calculate the amount of kinetic energy it initially had. And then we can go back from that kinetic energy it initially had. We can calculate how much speed the bullet had when it was launched into the paraffin block. So in this case, my bullet has a mass of 7.7 .7 grams, my paraffin block has a mass of 76.4 grams, and the length of the string from the pivot point up here to the center of mass of the paraffin block is 22.5 centimeters. So we'll be using those numbers later to do our calculation. But let's have a look at this demonstration. Okay, so we can see that it rose to an angle of, just let me jump around here, it rose to an angle of 34 degrees. So we can see it rose to an angle of 34 degrees, so we can use that to perform our calculation now. So reconsidering our ballistic pendulum, so initially we've got the paraffin block and we'll let it have mass mp here and we've got the bullet traveling towards it with some initial speed ub and we'll say that the mass of the bullet is given by mb so as the bullet collides with the paraffin assume momentum is conserved 
So momentum will be conserved, linear momentum will be conserved if external forces aren't playing a significant role in this, and they're not. We've got the gravitational force acting on the system, but that is very small compared to all of the internal forces involved. So then the bullet becomes stuck in the paraffin block, and the paraffin block moves up. So eventually it moves up to some height, let's call that H, where it comes to rest. And from when it starts moving to when it comes to rest, we can assume that mechanical energy is conserved. So we've basically got kinetic energy being converted into potential energy. Okay, so let's write down the equation to describe this first step. We've said that the momentum is conserved. So the initial momentum, the paraffin is stationary, so the momentum is all in the bullet. So the initial momentum is given by the mass of the bullet times the speed of the bullet. And this is equal to the final speed of the bullet plus the paraffin. So mass of bullet plus mass of paraffin times the final speed. So this gives us the speed just after that bullet has embedded itself in the paraffin. And now we consider the second part where they're now moving together as one object and energy is conserved. So here we've got that the initial kinetic energy, which is a half mass of the bullet plus the mass of the paraffin times V squared, which was the speed we just calculated here. And then at the end, we've got all the energy in the form of potential energy. So this is the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the paraffin times G times H. So now, if we let L be the length of our piece of string from the pivot point to the center of mass, that's L, then along here, we've got the same L here. And this is the theta here that we've measured. So this length here is equal to L cos theta. And so this length plus this length here is L. So this tells us that the height H is equal to L minus L cos theta. So we'll be able to use that for the H here. But what we can see is this will cancel off nicely. So we've got V squared is equal to 2gh, just rearranging this second equation here. And what we're trying to find is the initial speed of the bullet. So try, so we want to find ub. Okay, so let's call this one equation a, and we'll call this one equation b. So equation a, we can rearrange and we can write, well, ub is equal to mb plus mp over mb times v. And then in equation b, we've worked out what v squared is, so we can just substitute in the square root of that for v. So this is equal to mb plus mp over mb times the square root of 2gh. So that was sub in b. Okay, so now we can actually evaluate this because we measured all these things. So the mass of the bullet was 7.7 .7 grams. The mass of the paraffin was 76.4 grams. So that's in grams. The mass of the bullet, 7.7 .7 grams. So we've got grams on the top and grams on the bottom. So the units cancel each other out. So we don't need to worry about converting this into kilograms. You can if you want, you won't get it wrong, but we can save ourselves some time. And then we t times it by the square root of 2 times gravity, which is 9.80 times h. And for h, we were using L minus L cos theta. So this is L minus L cos theta, which we can pull L out in the front, and it's L1 minus cos theta. So this is times L, which was, we measured it, L was equal to 22.5 centimeters. So this is 0 0.225 meters. We do need to be in SI units here because we're not dividing by an L. And then we multiply it by 1 minus cos theta, and we measure theta to be 34 degrees. So we can substitute this into the calculator, and we end up with 9.48 
meters per second. We should just give it to two significant figures because a lot of the data was only measured to two significant figures. So this is 9.5 meters per second as the initial speed of the bullet as it embedded itself in the paraffin. So far when we've been considering momentum, we've been considering systems where the mass doesn't change. But this isn't always the case. A nice example is a rocket. So imagine the rocket on the launch pad. Quite a lot of the mass of the rocket is made up as its fuel. Now when the rocket takes off, there aren't really external forces acting on the rocket. Well, there's gravity which it has to overcome, but that's very small compared to the internal forces from expelling the fuel. So as the rocket launches, the rocket gains an outwards momentum because the fuel it has a downwards momentum. So overall, the total momentum of that rocket fuel system isn't changing, it's still zero but the rocket itself is gaining momentum because it's expelling the fuel. So let's have a look at how we can calculate the acceleration of the rocket as it expels the fuel. Okay, so let's consider our rocket. Let's draw our rocket here. This is the initial rocket. It's got mass m and it's traveling in this direction with some speed v. Now, time t later, Here is our rocket. Again, now it's sped up a little bit. Its speed is now V plus dV. But in order to speed up, it's had to lose some of its mass. So its mass is now M minus dM. But that mass hasn't just disappeared into thin air. We've got fuel going back this way with speed U and it's got mass dM. So that's where the missing mass has gone to. Now, the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And when we say that, we're talking about this system and this system. So we're including the fuel in this final momentum. Okay, so we can write mv is equal to, now we've got the fuel, the fuel is going in the opposite direction, so the negative direction. So the momentum of the fuel is equal to minus dm u, and the rocket also has momentum going forwards, so the mass of the rocket is m minus dm, and the speed of the rocket is v plus dv. So this is the final momentum of the rocket fuel system. Now, this we can simplify a bit if we consider the relative, the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So we've looked at relative velocities before. We've seen that the velocity of A relative to B was equal to the velocity of A minus the velocity of B. And in this case, we're looking at the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So this will be the velocity of the rocket, which is now V plus dV minus the velocity of the fuel. And the velocity of the fuel is minus u. The minus because it's going in the opposite direction. So this is equal to v plus dv plus u. So that gives us the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel. So we'll just rearrange this and we'll say, well, the velocity of the fuel is equal to the velocity of the rocket relative to the fuel minus v minus dv. And now that we've rearranged that, we're going to substitute this back up into this expression here. So we have mv is equal to minus dm. Now that's times u. So minus dm times v rel plus dm times v plus dm dv. So that is this term here. 
and then we've still got the remaining terms. So as we write these down, these terms here, we're going to expand the brackets. So we've got plus mv plus mdv minus dmv minus dmdv. Now we have so many terms and it's so messy, but a lot of these will cancel out. So let's cancel them out in yellow so we can still kind of see them. So we've got dmdv with a negative and here it is with a positive, so that disappears. Here's mv on the left-hand side and here it is again on the right-hand side. Now we've got a dmv here and a minus dmv here. So at the end of all that cancellation, we're left with this term and this term. So let's rearrange that and we have dmv rel is equal to mdv. Where this thing here is the mass lost from rocket. And this thing here is the mass of the rocket. Now we can actually make this into a nice rocket equation if we divide through by dt. So let's divide through by dt. We've got dm dt v rel is equal to m dv dt. And why this is a nice rocket equation is, well, we know that dv dt, that is the acceleration. Dm dt, that's the mass lost from the rocket. So we can actually give that a symbol r, which is the rate at which it's losing mass. So we've got r times the relative velocity between the rocket and the fuel is equal to ma. So this is our rocket equation. And it tells us about how quickly a rocket accelerates. Now, the other thing we might care about for our rocket is, well, how fast is it actually going? So if at time t initial, the rocket has mass m initial and it has a speed v initial, then at time t final, the rocket has mass m final and the rocket has speed v final. Well, what is the change in velocity? To do that, we can once again use this equation here. It's just we need to make both terms on this equation, both the, the terms on either side, be talking about the same thing so that we can integrate. Now, at the moment, this is the mass lost from the rocket, and on the right-hand side, we've got the mass of the rocket. So if we want to do the change in mass of the rocket, instead of considering this, we're going to consider this part, then that mass is actually lost. So we should write this as dm v rel is equal to m dv. And in this case, this dm, this is the change in mass of the rocket itself. Okay, so what we want to do is just integrate this and we've got here our limits for our integral. So let's rearrange and then integrate. So I'll just scroll up to get some more room. Sorry, picture. Okay, so we have minus dm on m times v rel is equal to dv. And now we're integrating. And we've said that when we have speed v initial, the mass of the rocket is m initial. When we have speed v final, the mass of the rocket is mass m final. And so solving this, when we integrate a one on x function, we end up with a log x. So this is equal to minus v rel, because that's a constant, times log m from m initial to m final is equal to this thing, which is just v from v initial to v final. So this is equal to minus v rel log m final minus log m initial is equal to v final minus v initial. And so let's get rid of this negative sign by putting a negative there and a positive there. Now, when we do log m initial minus log m final, we can write that as a fraction. So inside the logarithm. So we've got v final minus v initial is equal to v rel times log 
M initial over M final. And so that'll tell us by how much our rocket has sped up. So let's have a look at the problem now. Okay, so in this problem, we have a rocket with an initial mass of 850 kilogram, which consumes fuel at a rate of 2.3 kilograms per second. The speed V rail of the exhaust gas relative to the rocket engine is 2,800 meters per second. And we want to know what thrust does the rocket engine provide? Okay, so we have our rocket equation that the mass times the acceleration of the rocket is equal to the rate of exhaust times the relative velocity of the fuel and this fuel being released is the only force that is driving this rocket forwards so this is also equal to the net force which is the thrust so this is equal to the thrust so all we need to do to calculate the thrust is substitute into this equation so this is equal to 2.3 kilograms per second times 2,800, which gives us 6,440 newtons, or we should probably give it to two significant figures, so 6,400 newtons. So a problem, a five kilogram block with a speed of three meters per second collides with a 10 kilogram block that has a speed of two meters per second in the same direction. After the collision, the 10 kilogram block travels in the original direction with a speed of 2.5 meters per second. Part 1. What is the velocity of the 5 kilogram block immediately after the collision? Part 2. By how much does the total kinetic energy of the system of the two blocks change because of the collision? Part 3. Suppose instead that the 10 kilogram block ends up with a speed of 4 meters per second. What then is the change in kinetic energy? And part 4. Account for the result you obtained in C. So a good way to start this problem is start by drawing a diagram. So let's draw here what happens initially. So we've got one block here and we're told that it has a mass of five kilograms and we'll call that block one. And it's traveling with a speed of three meters per second. And then we have a second block, which is going in the same direction. So this is block two and it has a mass of 10 kilograms and it's traveling in the same direction at two meters per second. Then we're told that after the collision, so let's draw a final diagram over here. We've got this second block, the 10 kilogram block, traveling in the original direction, but now it's got a speed of 2.5 meters per second and we've got the first block still five kilograms and we don't know which what its velocity is. So in part A of the question, we're asked, what is the velocity of the five kilogram block immediately after the collision? So we'll assume that during the collision, momentum is conserved. So assume that during the collision, momentum is conserved so we can write m1u1 plus m2u2 is equal to m1v1 plus m2v2 which what we're trying to find is this v1 so we can rearrange this and write well v1 is equal to m1u1 plus m2u2 minus m2v2 and this is all divided by m1 and now we know everything here so we can just substitute in so here we're going to do five times three that's the initial speed and velocity of block one and then we've got plus 10 times two minus 10 times 2.5 all over the mass of block one, which is five kilograms. Now, solving that on the calculator, we end up with two meters per second. And that's a positive number, so it's in the same direction. Now, part B of the question 
asks us by how much does the total kinetic energy of the system of the two blocks change because of the collision. So the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So that's equal to a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared minus a half m1 u1 squared plus a half m2 u2 squared and we can just substitute into this. So we've got a half times five times v1, which we just calculated, so that's our two and that's squared, plus a half times m2, so that's 10, times v2, which we were told was 2.5, minus a half times five times three squared, plus a half times 10 times two squared, then we solve this on the calculator and we end up with minus 1.25, which we can write as minus 1.3 joules. So this tells us that 1.3 joules, i.e. 1.3 joules is lost during the collision. Okay, part C then says, suppose that instead that the 10 kilogram block ends up with a speed of four meters per second. Okay, so let's do this in red. So rather than 2.5 meters per second, it's now going at four meters per second. And we're then asked, what is the change in total kinetic energy? So we need to calculate the change in total kinetic energy again, which we'll use this same formula for as we used up here. So we'll use this equation down here. But the difficulty is that we're given V2, but we're going to have to calculate V1 again, because if the final velocity of the second block has changed, then the final velocity of the first block will also change. So we shall need to substitute into this equation again in order to calculate V1 again. So V1 is going to be equal to five times three, plus 10 times two, the initial conditions didn't change, but now we've got minus 10 times four, because that final velocity is different, and then divided by five. And when we solve that one on the calculator, we end up with minus 1.0 meters per second. So now this block is going back in the opposite direction. That's what our negative sign indicates at 1.0 meters per second. So now we can substitute into our equation up here. So we've got a half times five times one squared. We could put minus one squared if we want, but when we square the negative sign, it disappears. So I just haven't bothered writing it down. So plus a half times 10 times four squared minus, same thing, a half times five times three squared plus a half times 10 times two squared. And then we solve that one on the calculator and we end up with, 40 joules. So this tells us that this time it's gained 40 joules of energy. So in part D, it says account for your, your result obtained in C. So let's just scroll up a bit. I mean, the surprising thing, the surprising thing is that this is positive, so that indicates that it's gained kinetic energy. So this energy has to come from somewhere. E.g. an explosion. So we can't just create energy out of nothing it has to have been stored somewhere so it could have been stored in chemical potential energy and an explosion took place and it was converted into kinetic energy for example so the next problem as shown in the figure block one with a mass m1 slides from left along a frictionless ramp from a height h which is 2.5 meters and then collides with stationary block two which has mass m2 after the collision, block 2 slides into a region where the coefficient of kinetic friction is mu k, which is 0 0.500, and comes to a stop in distance d within that region. And then we're asked, what is the value of the distance d in metres if the collision is a elastic or b completely inelastic? Okay, so in this problem, it's a bit complicated, 
we've got a block which slides down a ramp it's got mass m1 and it slides down a height h so as it slides down its potential energy goes into kinetic energy and so at the bottom of the slope we can write well mgh m1 gh because we'll call this one mass one is equal to a half m1 and we'll call it u1 squared because this as far as we're concerned is the velocity before the collision so our initial velocity in this case so we can cancel out this m1s and we can rearrange this and this tells us that u1 squared is equal to 2gh which tells us that u1 is equal to the square root of 2gh so we now know the speed of block one when it gets to the bottom of the slope now at the bottom of the slope some interesting stuff happens it collides with block block two which then goes along this area with friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction mu k is equal to 0 0.500 and in part A, we have an elastic collision. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide the page in half and we'll do part B here, which is completely inelastic. Okay, so in an elastic collision, in any collision, momentum is conserved. So we've got m1 u1 plus m2 u2 is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. Now in this collision, m2 is initially, initially stationary, which tells us that u2 is equal to zero. So this term here is equal to zero. We're also told in the question that m2 is equal to 2 m1. So... For this case, we've got m1 u1 is equal to m1 v1 plus 2 m1 v2. Just substituting in uh, mass 2 here. And so the m1s occur in every term, so cancel out. So we end up with u1 is equal to v1 plus 2 v2. And we calculated up here that this was equal to the square root of 2gh. So that's what we get by considering the conservation of momentum. But because it's elastic, kinetic energy is also conserved. So we've got kinetic energy initial is equal to kinetic energy final. And initial is just before block one collides. Final is just after block one hits block two. So we've got a half m1 u1 squared. Now block 2 is initially, initially stationary, so that's 0. And this is equal to a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared. And let's substitute in this mass 2 is 2 mass 1. So this is a half mass 1 v1 squared plus a half 2 m1 v2 squared. Okay, now in every single term here, we've got a half m1. So we can cancel all those out. So a half m1, we can do it in these middle ones too, but we don't have to. Yeah, let's get rid of all those. Okay, now what we're going to do is rearrange up here, and we have v1 is equal to u1 minus 2v2. And then we'll substitute this in here for this v1 squared. So we have u1 squared is equal to u1 minus 2v2 squared plus 2v2 squared. So this is equal to u1 squared minus 4u1 v2 plus 4v2 squared plus 2v2 squared. So the u1 squareds on each side cancel out and we end up with 4u1 v2 is equal to 6 v2 squared we can cancel 1 v2 from each side and we end up with v2 is equal to 4u1 on 6 but then u1 we've calculated up here as the square root of 2gh so 4 divided by 6 that's the same as 2 over 3 times the square root of 2gh 
So we have now calculated the velocity of the second block as it enters the spot with the friction. So now we have the speed of block two when it comes to this rough spot and we lose and we lose all kinetic energy as work against friction. So that tells us that a half m2 v2 squared is equal to the work done against friction which is mu k m g, that's the frictional force, times the distance it travels over because work is equal to f dot s, where s is the displacement. Okay, and what we're trying to do is find d, and this is m2 here, it's the mass of block two. Okay, so let's rearrange this to make d the subject because that's what we're trying to find, the distance it's gone. So when we're doing this, this is mass 2 because it's the mass of block 2. So those will cancel and I end up with, well, d is equal to v2 squared over 2. And then we've still got the mu k and we've got this g. Okay, so now we've calculated v2 just above, so we can square that and substitute it in. So 2 thirds squared, that's 4 ninths. Square root of 2gh squared, that's 2gh. And then we're dividing by 2 mu k g. So these 2s cancel out, these g's cancel out, and we end up with 4 ninths h over mu k. Now we're given h and mu k in the question, h is 2.5 so this is 4 over 9 times 2.5 over 0 0.5 and solving that we get 2.22 meters so that's the case for the elastic collision now in the second part we're asked about the completely inelastic case so for the completely inelastic case the two blocks stick together and we have v1 is equal to v2 is equal to v. Now the conservation of momentum is still the same. So we've still got this part here. But in this case we've got well u1 is equal to v plus 2v so that's equal to 3v and u1 is still equal to the square root of 2gh because that we got up the top here just from the potential energy considerations. So this tells us that, well, in this case, V is equal to the square root of 2GH on 3. Now, once we've got the speed, we can do what we did down here again to calculate how far it goes, because we've got a half. Now, in this case, we've got the two blocks stuck together. So we'll put M1 plus M2 times V squared. So this gives us the kinetic energy of these two blocks just before they hit the rough spot. And then all this kinetic energy is lost doing work against friction. So that's mu k m1 plus m2 g d. These cancel. And once again, I've got the same expression. I've got d is equal to v squared over 2 mu k g. And now I can substitute in my v. So this is equal to 2gh over 9 times 2 mu k g. My g's will cancel out. These 2's will cancel out. And so I end up with h over 9 mu k. So it's similar to before, but before we had a factor of 4 out the front. So this is a quarter of what it was before. So we can then substitute in, we've got 2.5 over 9 times 0 0.500. 0. So this is equal to 0 0.556 meters. Okay, so that's how we solve that problem. So in this problem, a 6,090 kilogram space probes moving nose first towards Jupiter at 105 meters per second relative to the sun. It fires its rocket engine um, there's an ejection of 80 kilograms of exhaust at a speed of 253 meters per second relative to the space probe. And we're asked, what is the final velocity of the probe? So in this problem, we've got a space probe with an initial mass of 6,090 kilograms. It's initially heading towards Jupiter with a speed of 105 meters per second. 
it then exhausts some fuel. Its change in mass, so the amount of fuel it exhausts, is equal to 80 kilograms. And the velocity of the fuel relative to the space probe is 253 meters per second. And we're asked what's the final speed of the space probe. So we derived the expression that the final velocity minus the initial velocity is equal to the relative velocity of the exhaust to the um, probe in this case, um, times log of the initial mass over the final mass. So we've got almost all these things. The final mass is going to be equal to the initial mass minus the change in the mass. So let's rearrange this. We have the final mass is equal to the initial mass plus the relative speed, sorry, the initial speed plus the relative speed times log initial mass over initial mass minus delta m. Now we've got absolutely everything here, so we can just substitute in. So this is equal to 105 plus 253 times log of 6090 over 6090 minus 80. 6090 minus 80 is 6010. So we can put that all into the calculator and we end up with 108 meters per second and that'll be towards Jupiter.